us today. And um, everybody is thinking about our, our healthcare workers because we are all so dependent upon you and we know that you are putting yourselves in the line of fire. You're sacrificing your own health uh, daily to make sure that this uh, coronavirus um, spreads as little as possible and as quickly as possible. We're trying to flatten the curve, uh, trying to flatten the curve. And uh, with your help, we're going to learn more about it and also what we can do to, to uh, be supportive of the healthcare professionals. So we're going to focus on the virus's impact on the healthcare workers. Um, and we thank them for their service. So if you could start, Martha, by telling us a little bit about your union, how many you represent, uh, and just overall the work of the union, that would be helpful. Very good. And thank you, Danielle. And this is an interesting time. You know, uh, I'm an RN and uh, president of our healthcare union at Jackson Health System that represents the 4,000 RNs, uh, another probably 1,300 healthcare professionals like pharmacists, dietitians, social workers, et cetera, and the attending physicians. And the attending physicians, a lot of them, as you very well know, Dave Woolsey is an officer in our union and in our ED, uh, you know, taking care of patients that are coming with flu-like symptoms. That's and the emergency department. ED. Yes, thank you. Oh yeah, you're gonna have to probably correct me a lot. A lot of these little acronyms are free flowing. <laughs> Not but, too early. Uh, yeah, so we have about 5,600 healthcare professionals at Jackson and another 5,600 that are uh, the service and technical workers that work closely beside us uh, with the AFSME union and, and all of us work to take the best care of patients in this community. And I always gotta say what a, a pleasure it is to work as a healthcare worker under the umbrella uh, that Jackson Health System has to deliver a single high standard of care to all residents, not citizen residents, regardless of their ability to pay. And that mission has been something that uh, it's a, just a little over 100 years now, but it was in 1918 when the flu epidemic was devastating Dade County and Dr. Jackson said, hey, we need a city hospital. And that's when Jackson was founded. So it was actually a flu epidemic that did it. And when I was, um, I grew up in Ohio and went to Ohio State University School of Nursing. And when I came down here in the 80s, it was the AIDS epidemic. And other hospitals were, you know, saying, get out of here, whatever it is, we don't know. And Jackson was like, we don't know what it is, but we'll help you. What is it? And it was with Dr. Margaret Fischel uh, from University of Miami working with Jackson's, you know, team to discover what is this and how can we take care of these patients? And with their research, uh, you know, and others, it's been now a disease you can live with instead of be a death sentence. So now we have the COVID-19. You know, so it's another bump in the road, but we all got to be thankful that we have a public hospital. And yeah. I was talking to one of the leaders, uh, or I guess it was a journalist, saying, wow, the public hospital seem to be doing better than the private. And I said, that's our mission, to rise above at times like this. And, uh, you know, it gets scary, but it's at times like this that, uh, you know, we're proud to be able to take care of the community in times of needs and, you know, for the firefighters in 9-11, they felt, had to feel a lot of the same. And, um, you know, it's a calling and I think people who wanna do these types of professions really care. Well, thank you so much for those uplifting words and for the historical perspective. And I too had the opportunity to work with Dr. Fischel and Dr. Scott at the beginning of the AIDS wow. epidemic, shortly after I came to, to Miami and I was working with children who were affected wow. um, by AIDS epidemic. So talk to us a little bit about the employees. How are they coping with this uh, yeah. crisis? Well, they're nervous. You know, they're coming to work, <laughs> but they're nervous. Uh, the biggest kind of, uh, I'd say we're operating with a blindfold on is because we're not, you know, uh, we don't have enough tests. So we can't test everybody we should. You know, and we've seen this disease move across, across the globe. So we know the best science is to really test everyone and see where it is and see where the hot spots are and really crack down where we see the hot spots that contain this virus. But we were, you know, Jackson has, you know, 1500 beds at Jackson Memorial and we have Jackson North and Jackson South. And I, you know, I don't know if we've done a hundred tests, you know, it's minimal testing is happening because of the, I'll say the bureaucracy and I'll take it right to the top with this president who thought it was nothing and gonna pass by April 
and we did not start you know making sure tests were going to be available when it moved across to this continent and let alone the ppe another fear is is there enough ppe protective a personal protective equipment and while jackson assures us they have enough they're handing it out very sparingly you know you've got to have a patient it's either being ruled out for COVID-19 or has it. And there's been very few that actually test positive that are in our hospital. Um, and few, I mean, less than five. But the health department is reporting it by county, not by hospital. But, um, you know, so they're getting the, the, the masks or the gowns, but, you know, kind of as needed. And it's kind of an uneasy feeling because they're used to looking in supply cabinets and seeing boxes and just calling and say, hey, I need another box of N95s and it gets delivered. This is much tighter. And I just think it's responsible of management, but it is a little bit of an uneasy feeling. Is it really, is the next box really there? Especially mm. when you're hearing across the globe of the shortage. So, wow. Wow. you know. Mark, that's, yeah. that's really sobering. So what are the uh, medical staff doing uh, to protect themselves in the absence of the testing? and in the absence of the personal protective. Yeah, well, Jackson does not have the absence of the protective equipment yet. They have it and we're getting it. So we're gowning and gloving. And you know, Dave Woolsey, who works in our emergency department, our attending physician, you know, he said he's been blowing through that equipment because he's tested five patients, you know, just this morning or whatever, you know, so they're getting everything they need. It's just an uneasy feeling to learn this new system of distribution that it's not gonna show up till you need it. Um, and it's you know, management is having difficulty. They're actually, I think, going to limit some visitors. People are leaving the hospital with suitcases full of PPE. You know, they're, people are starting to take it, whether they're visitors, um, you know, so it, that's a risk. So management's being very tight on it and trying to release it only when we need it so that it's there when we do need it. And so far we've had it. But, um, you know, the hardest part is I had a nurse call me yesterday that a up in one of the IMCU units that a, a woman came through the ED with a foot issue and she had a history of diabetes and, and dialysis. And, and yet he said uh, to me, he said, you know, this patient has a fever and is short of breath and we're putting on the oxygen. I think she needs tested and they can't, they won't give me an N95. And I said, well, you need to put on a mask and, you know, start going up your chain of command and getting that patient tested. And indeed, they, of course, tested the patient, gave him the N95 mask. But, you know, it's, it's scary. I guess sometimes they're forgetting that, you know, you can do this. You're a nurse and, and you know, our advocacy for patients, you know, and where it's not a perfect system, there's going to be patients that come in with a, in this case, a foot problem, and they didn't get worked up for the flu. And we're going to be the ones on the floors that discover they're admitted, and let's work them up. So um, she's being worked up. It takes a couple of days to rule it out. That's another unfortunate thing. You know, the test in other continents has taken only six hours, and we're taking 48 hours. You know, that's well, a lot of here. Uh, you know, I've heard that uh, the rapid tests are going to be available very soon. Yeah. Uh, also, you know that the private companies are doing more testing. What, what can what can you say to the average person? Uh, they should be doing. Right. Well, the tests are becoming more available and hopefully we're going to kick in more manufacturing of everything we need, whether it's PPE or tests. But the average person, you know, the, the average person, this could be, and we don't know because we don't have enough data yet, but this could be a regular flu, you know, that we get and you can survive it by staying home and, you know, doing your chicken soup and fluids and isolating yourself from others sleeping, resting, taking care of yourself. But if you have symptoms that are serious, like shortness of breath because of this flu, if you're having, you know, your blood pressure's climbing or you have a, you know, headache that feels like your blood pressure's climbing, if you don't have a vehicle to check your own blood pressure, you know, if you have a serious symptom, you should and must come to a hospital emergency department. It's not only Jackson, it's any emergency department. But first people are saying, call your physician. You don't want to go running around the county if you think you have this. But if you have a symptom that's serious, you must go to a, uh, an emergency department. And hopefully uh, at Jackson, and I think University of Miami, and I assume other hospitals, we've got a tent set up. 
in the back um, where people that are coming through with upper respiratory tract inf infections and symptoms are being taken to that tent so that we don't expose others. And then we're doing, uh, I was told yesterday we had 100 people come to the tent and 51 people they felt needed tested for COVID-19. Wow. So now it'll take us 48 hours to hear that result. But um, so that's, <clears throat> that's the drill so that, in other words, that other 49, um, you know, got sent home most likely. And of that 51 that were tested, uh, most of them, but one or two got sent home too. You know, it depends. They'll evaluate your symptoms if you need admitted. The mm -hmm. only reason you'll stay in the hospital, uh, if you have the shortness of breath that needs some intervention, you know, either oxygen or God forbid, a ventilator, you know, but we have that ability and we're not short on ventilators. Um, but um, so most people should call their primary care doc and talk about this. And then they might send somebody to test you, you know, hopefully in the future, or they might say, go to the health department and get tested. You know, or it's when not drive through ones that are hopefully going to be set up more in Miami-Dade. We have a couple of the drive yeah, right. centers in Broward. We have CHI in South Dade that's doing some drive-by, but hopefully we're going to have more of that, right? So people don't have to go into an office. It can be done uh, kind of remotely. What about yeah. telemedicine? What is your advice about that? Well, uh, Jackson has MD Live, which is, I, I think, I think for most insurances, it's a $10 copay, and I think they may be waiving it for COVID-19s. But um, you, you dial a phone number and you talk to your doctor. And I, I think they have some video capacity, you know, mm -hmm. like before this, they were thinking, you know, show me your tongue, you know, <laughs> open your mouth wide, let me look at your tongue. So, you know, they could do some things. But um, yeah, that's kind of cool. You know, this MD Live may be a good place to call. Uh, it's probably on Jackson's website, uh, but you can, you know, there is some telemedicine. I'm not sure if Baptist and other hospitals have it, but Jackson has it. You actually talk yes, to a uh, caregiver. Baptist, Baptist has it. I know Florida Blue has it. Yeah. Great. What about visitation hours? Are, are there still visitation hours at Jackson? Right. There are. They tried to limit them. Most hospitals in the last decade have gone to open visitation for, you know, family and patient satisfaction. And uh, with this virus, they limited it at Jackson uh, from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and only two people. And I think they're considering it, tighten it down a little more. Mm -hmm. um, my message to the public would be that, you know, don't come to a hospital where COVID-19 patients are coming if you don't need to. It's not, it's a high risk move right now. Um, you know, if you have someone that you desperately need to see, you know, and they're letting a parent or someone stay with a child 24 hours, obviously. Uh, if someone's in, um, you know, the end of life, they're letting people stay 24 in an ICU, they'll let you stay 24. But I would just challenge people, you know, if you have a good friend that's in the hospital, you know, maybe not the wisest thing just to go visit them to be kind, as we normally would think of it. Reconsider perhaps the need to go expose you or others as we try and kind of, um, socially space ourselves and, and uh, stay home when possible. Very good. Okay, what about elective procedures? We're hearing this is not the time for procedures yeah. either. Your advice yeah. about that? Yeah, I think most people are self-selecting on that. You know, it's uh, our ORs are about half as busy as they've been. Um, that this would be operating rooms, ORs. <laughs> yeah, more rooms. This is gonna be interesting because you know, ORs are the economic engine of any hospital. Mm. We're balancing on the head of a pin with how do we take care of people and survive financially. Um, but obviously, everybody's got to put this COVID-19 front and center and to focus on the health of uh, the community and in the world uh, versus, you know, the economic health. But um, I think our, there will be a point. And if I think every hospital is following, you know, they, they're, we're hoping we can dampen that curve in every other country. Um, you know, China, Italy, you know, if South Korea has done better, but how we don't spike and come down, but we flatten that curve. And uh, so elective surgeries may be a way that we uh, minimize people's exposure, you know, to flatten the curve. It's, um, it's I guess it's a matter of uh, hospital administrators are looking at when to call that moment. Um, obviously, they're monitoring. I think we have, you know, 
like I said, less than, I think the number's three in our hospital, you know, so, and they're isolating them on med surge floors. There's no one in an ICU. Um, there's certainly no one in an OR that we know of. Again, broad testing has not happened. So, right, you know, right. we can only talk about the ones we know. Um, there could be our neighbors having elective surgery that are exposed and we don't know it. We have, you know, I think it would almost be comforting to know that there's masses that have it and are doing well and we just don't know it, uh, building immunities to this virus. But um, yeah, I think elective surgeries are going to self-select down and our children's hospitals volume is coming down. Parents are not taking their kids in for elective surgeries. I think that's all smart and it'll probably come to a time if there is a peak that we say, listen, stop. But I really want to dampen that curve and do anything we can to. Right, right, right. right. So everybody, that's why stay home. It's safer at home. Uh, obviously, we've closed most establishments here so that there aren't excuses for people to go out, just the, the necessities. Um, so all of that is about uh, reducing the curve, uh, flattening the curve. Okay, now what about our healthcare workers and their uh, mental health? What can we do to support healthcare workers who are on the front line and who are clearly uh, feeling stressed about yeah. the situation. Yeah, well, it's always amazing how good food feels when you're under stress, you know, that's comfort mm -hmm. food. Uh, I guess a Venezuelan restaurant yesterday sent meals into our emergency department at Maine. We've got another restaurant today asking how can they send in 2000 croquetas, you know, and um, <laughs> the United Teachers of Day dropped us a basket full of, you know, unhealthy food, you know, snacks and uh, Rice Krispie treats and chocolate donuts, you know, so we've got to figure out how we're going to distribute those without violating our rules of safety. Um, but people are, you know, always glad to see um, food arrive. I always used to say peanut butter and saltines used to always taste so good in the ICU, you know, it's crazy. It's, it's treated like filet mignon or something. But um, food is nice. And then, you know, obviously, the, the members themselves are asking a lot about where's the hazard pay, man, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's rough. This is an economic time. Uh, uh, you know, you're one of our favorite commissioners. You know, where all the unions are bargaining for cost of living increases. I told management, now is the time to say, give that cost of living. It's a little bitty skinny thing of one or 2%. Give it and say, thank you. You know, I think mm -hmm. urgency of money is one thing. Um, I think it would help, you know, it's not something you want to throw money at, but something little would certainly signify that uh, they're respecting you, appreciating you, and thanking you for your dedication to your profession in this community. So Good. we're pushing on management to do something like that. Thank you, thank you. And uh, tell us about the union's role in all of this. How does do it's not just the healthcare worker but the fact that they're represented by a union so what is the role that the union can play uh at this time of crisis and bringing down the pandemic yeah and um you know i see that's my major responsibility right now as president and i have you know just to clarify i haven't worked in the trauma icu since 08 when the last recession hit and it became a full-time job as president and uh you know we're advocating obviously for our members to get everything they need for safety uh, so that they can take care of this community to the best of their abilities while keeping themselves safe. Um, we're working out issues with management and how to make sure if God forbid the peak happens, how do we get more nurses? We're talking to our retired nurses. Mm -hmm. We're seeing if they might want to come back. We're negotiating with management. What kind of, kind of emergency rates would attract people back? Uh, I talk with um, the, you know, leaders at Jackson every day to see, you know, how do we do staffing? If our ORs really close down, uh, how do we get those OR nurses kind of trained to help in the emergency department if that's where the, you know, ground zero is? Our Holtz hospital check, you know, calms down to low census. How do we get those nurses trained? Let's use educators. If we have immunocompromised nurses working, how do we use them not at the front line, but put them in a place maybe to train these nurses. You know, so we're working on logistics with management to get our members um, to stay stay safe and healthy, and how they can best um, you know kind of survive this, but work front right. front and center with the patients who are affected. Excellent, excellent. Uh, let me just tell those who are watching uh, that please, this is the time. If you have a question, we're going to ask that you type it into the chat box. 
Um, we can't open up all the mics. It creates um, a cacophony of noises and we can't hear each other. So if you could, if you have any questions or any comments, please put them in the chat box and we'll be going till about uh, 4.30. So we have time for a few questions and, and comments. Uh, so just to go back to your last point, you are really looking ahead. So right now the hospital is not overwhelmed, the resources are not overwhelmed, but we know from how it has unfolded in other places that we can expect to see an increase in cases and we need to have the uh, equipment, we need to have the uh, personal uh, protective uh, gear and we need to have the personnel. So you're looking ahead to who you could have on backup because I know that is one of the real challenges is the burnout of the, the staff that you know might be called into service for, for long hours and multiple days. Uh, and, and we need them. We need them to be healthy uh, psychologically as well as, as physically healthy. So let me just check in here to see if we have any um, comments. We have one. Ah. <laughs> We're having some points that are made here, just to reiterate Martha's points. Uh, telemedicine, Jackson Health System uses MD Live, and we also want to reschedule elective procedures so we don't overwhelm the hospitals. And um, of course, I'm going to say that we're really delighted that you came on representing the healthcare workforce. And we know you are the front line. Uh, there are many, many people that are doing gargantuan jobs, really showing up for the, the public during this crisis. Uh, nobody is more important than the frontline healthcare workers. You can be the difference between life and death, uh, health and, and sickness. And so, you know, we really, really want to thank you. Okay, we have a comment here I just saw from uh, Dr. Leo. Thank you, Danielle and Martha. That was one of my biggest concerns uh, known that we have Okay, so he, the personal protective uh, gear to know that we have them right now uh, in stock. That was wonderful. Thank you for the comment. Uh, and Cecilia Tavera Webman says thank you uh, to me and to Martha for doing this uh, for us. It might be a silly question, but I live in a high rise. Is it safe to use the community pool? No, I had not heard that question. Great question, Martha. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Martha. Let's tell well, Cecilia. I say there's chlorine in there. <laughs> That's the good thing. Uh, chlorine and bleach is probably one of the best things to kill any virus. Um, geez. I, I would think yes, but uh, it's safe to use the pool. It's probably, you know, the way that it's good to exercise. That builds your immunity. Um, you know, if you want to put a, remember the old nose plugs and the bathing hat, you know, and the goggles? If you want to do that, you could. Uh, as far as we know, this virus is, um, uh, not airborne, except under conditions of what they call aerialization, where like in an, when you use an ambu bag in a hospital to intubate a patient and you kind of hyperventilate the patient and blow secretions perhaps around. If you and I are just talking, it's on a droplet of our saliva or our breath that's with moisture and it's traveling. But once it hit the pool and the chlorine, I got to believe it would die. But uh, I'm not the scientist on that. Um, you know, that's the reason they put chlorine in pools is to kill any bacteria that we would have normally on our skin or anywhere to kill it. So I got to believe it's a pretty safe, especially if you swim and then immediately get out and shower and maybe shower more appropriately. You could use soap maybe around your mucous membranes or your eyes and your face and your nose so that there's nothing sitting there. But if you just want to stick your feet in and or sit in the pool and that feels better, you know, don't put your face under, maybe that's safer. You know, it's really where it hits your mucous membranes. We can all assume we may have touched all kinds of bacteria all day long or viruses. And when we wash our hands, we get rid of that. Um, you know, it's got to get to your mucous membranes to get you exposed and sick. Yeah, and thank you. And let's just reiterate, I think everybody's really heard this washing your hands for 20 seconds at least uh, with a good soap, um, not touching your face because like you say, you're touching surfaces and this virus can survive on surfaces for several days. I mean, it's quite a, a, a tough virus. Uh, so we wanna be sure uh, using the disinfectant, of course, not touching, uh, maintaining that distance of six feet to protect against the, the secretions. Um, and really the best thing is to stay home. 
you know, now we have in the city of Miami uh, a stay at home order. Uh, I'm hopeful that the county will look at this as well. I have called the mayor to do that, the county mayor. Uh, you know, of course, we do have emergencies. We do have to get our food. Um, you know, the fact that people are still preparing food for us and delivering, uh, you know, uh, is good, but we just want to avoid the contact wherever possible if we can stay home and uh, that's the best. You know, no contact was really going to flatten the curve. Okay, I see here that we have a comment from uh, Danny Vargas. He says, thank you. Uh, very welcome, Danny. Uh, how long do we expect elective procedures such as knee replacement surgery to be postponed? I don't know if you're having some elective surgery, Danny, but <laughs> go ahead, Martha. Can you answer the question? You know, I don't, if they cancel elective surgeries, which I would expect they do at some point on the curve as we would start to peak, if, you know, then we would cancel them. And I guess we wouldn't do elective surgeries back in the hospitals until we get kind of on the downward side of that curve and felt we were safe enough to bring patients back. You know, that's kind of an unnecessary risk you'd have to weigh with a surgery. Probably an elective knee surgery would obviously not be as important as, um, a surgery to open up your, you know, LAD of your heart, you know, your, um, right. so it's, you know, they'll, they'll probably weigh that, uh, how important is a surgery, you know, to, you know, resume good life. And, and if mm -hmm. it's, if you can wait, I'd suggest we get on the outside of this curve, um, the other side of this curve before we go back into hospitals. Very but good. thank you. Thank you, uh, Martha. And I see here from one of my team members that the CDC, um, is uh, saying that it is safe to use pools and hot tubs uh, with proper operation maintenance and disinfection because of the chlorine and the bromine um, that, that that should remove the virus. So uh, things uh, fit with the CDC uh, guidance uh, on that point. So um, let's just wrap up with a last question about ventilators. We know that when people are very ill, that it does lead to not only shortness of breath, but really the lungs fill up uh, with fluid, making it difficult to breathe, and that there may be a shortage of ventilators. What is our status with ventilators? Wow, I don't know the exact number of ventilators we have, but we have, um, just at Jackson, Maine, we must have several hundred, you know, and then we've got north and south and, um, so I gotta believe we have several hundred ventilators. The, you know, there's 120 ICU beds. We've got every, almost every patient, obviously, that goes into an operating room is on a ventilator. Um, you know, recovery rooms, we probably have several hundred. I do not know the exact number. We have not had a shortage of this. You know, this is, again, the data. I'm not sure how, we haven't had a patient that's needed to be put on a ventilator that's positive for COVID-19. Uh, or being worked up for COVID-19. So, oh, I see. Not yet. you know, mm -hmm. so I don't know what the odds are of ventilators you're going to need. Um, you know, Italy seemed to be kind of unique and it spiked high and fast, you know, from, uh, you know, February 25th to March 3rd, you know, they went from needing, you know, what, 100 ventilators to 800 ventilators. So uh, this is really, uh, I would just emphasize what you said, um, Commissioners, so we've got to dampen this curve. Let's not get to the place where we need 800 ventilators. Um, I know there's companies I heard today in the news going to go into manufacturing of ventilators. You know, um, I'm hoping we can, uh, you know, not need that peak and um, uh, see where we get to. So, very good. Yeah, very good. I'd have to check on how many we have, but I think it's several hundred. <laughs> well, look, uh, Martha, thank you so very much. Clearly, you um, are, are a person who knows the healthcare system, knows the needs of the healthcare workers and the patients. I feel great confidence knowing that you're the president of our uh, SEIU union there at Jackson. I want to thank you so very, very much. And on behalf of the listeners, this interview, by the way, will be posted on our Facebook page as well for people who missed the live Zoom. So please let others know. And once the link is up, we have to download it through YouTube. Once the link is up, please uh, do pass it on. I do want to let our listeners know that our next speaker on Monday at 4 p.m. will be Wendy Walsh. She is in charge of Unite, the union that represents many of the workers at the airport. And of course, we know that airplanes are grounded, that uh, flights have, have gone down 
to a fraction of, of what they have been. And uh, most of those workers are now out of work. So we're gonna be talking with Wendy about uh, the impact on those workers, on uh, the airport industry. Uh, and after Monday's chat, we're going to be hopefully having Nikki Freed, our Commissioner of Agriculture, and talking about some of the regulations and food issues. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. And we have other great speakers lined up for the future. So stay tuned to our Community Care series, uh, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at four o'clock. Thank you so very much, Martha. And thanks to our audience and our listeners. Thank you for being the great leader that you are. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Martha. Okay, take good care.